why do you decide to write a book about John McGock? Um, simple reason, really. I really wanted to read a book about him. Um, I thought, well, there's got to be, there'll have to be something out there. So I had a little look. I was on a train journey at the time and there wasn't one. Um, and I just thought, well, you really want to read about him. Why not have a go at writing it? Which is a bit kind of weird, m maybe not the normal reaction, but um, yeah, that was it. So I just um, there and then sent a message via social media to his daughter, Emily, and said, uh, look, I'd really love to do this. Your dad was amazing. Um, what do you reckon? And it sort of went from there, really. I mean, I mean, what was your background to discovering his music? I mean, I'm guessing here, but I think you're a different generation. Didn't grow up to this real time. I mean, he's an amazing guitar player, very much part of the post-punk scene, but not, uh, not, not a nationally famous guitar player, not like... The great, the great dusty old rock cannon, cannon you know. <laughs> so to, to discover him, what's your route to get there? Right, I guess, um, well, like as a kid, so we're going back sort of late 1990s, growing up in Walthamstow, East London, we used to have a really cool second-hand record shop and I'd always be going in and out of there, you know, listening to anything. If the cover or whatever appealed to me, I'd get it. Um, and I got to hear Shot by Both Sides and it was on like a really naff, compilation like some kind of greatest punk hits or some nonsense and um and I remember listening to it on the way to school one day and uh it just blew me away it was so different from everything else on there and it just really stood out and of course you know it's that guitar part that really sort of draws you in and then from there on I was just and so I'm, we're going back I was about 14 years old massive magazine fan from that point um not so much aware of the Banshees um but of course then as I started to find out more about the individuals involved and, and started to follow what John had done. That led me then to, to getting into Susie and the Banshees. And my God, just sort of got better and better, really. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's sort of my path. I mean, the interesting thing is, like, my mum will wind me up about it now because she saw a magazine yeah, a good, good, good few times. She even saw the Banshees as well. So it's like, all right, cheers. But, yeah, well, well beyond, my, like, like, prior to my generation. But it's just music, I think, that... It's kind of timeless. I and mean, if it's good, it's always going to be good, you know? I mean, his, his work in Magazine, which is his first kind of known work in it, because he did have his own kind of school band before that. But it's um, it's, it's astounding, isn't it? It's, it's kind of off the time. And like, even if you take a shot by both sides on its own as a song, it's a great punk rock song that, as you say, is nothing really like punk rock, isn't it? Well, that's it. And I think that's, that's what I re I think maybe that was part of... It's part of the appeal, definitely, of magazine, and maybe part of the problem as well, because they were, you know, very different, I think, and they, they they sort of started off in a way that, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe they didn't fit the kind of what was going on. Uh, you know, there was a lot to unpack with them, and very talented guys. But, yeah, I just think in some ways it's, it's music that, especially as you move through their albums and you get to sort of secondhand daylight and, um, you know, correct use of soap, it, it's just... Maybe it appeals more now. I don't know. I just, I just, there's something about them that just, I just think they should be so much better known and, and respected than they are. They, you know, people will mention them, but they're not, they just, they do go under the radar a bit. And that's probably true, as you're saying, of John himself, you know, when we're thinking of the kind of standout players, you know, maybe he doesn't get the bring in that he should, but his, his output was just astounding. It really, really was. You think part of the problem is, is that, um, I mean, he's an astounding guitar player, a standout guitar player, but he always tends to be in bands with kind of very iconic, very uh, difficult, quite difficult to work with in the best possible way kind of singers that maybe even accidentally, not intentionally, overshadow his work. Oh, I think that's true. Um, I think that's true. And, and, and like you look at these sort of career progression and, and the relationships, and I think there was... There were a lot of issues within all the bands that he was in, a lot of kind of personality clashes. Um, I think when he joined, I, I don't think, like, if we're going to be honest about it, him and Howard were particularly close. I think there was a bit of friction between the two of them. Um, I think by the time he got to the Banshees, I think actually the, the kind of personality that he was, and he was a pretty fiery guy, you know, he had a bit of a temper on him, but I think that really appealed to Susie, that he wasn't a yes man. She really liked that, you know, he'd stand his ground and he wouldn't just sort of bow down to whatever, you know, either herself or Severin were kind of, who obviously were very much the leaders of that group. Um, so that appealed. But um, 
Yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there he is. And I think one of the things about John, and we're talking about bands, and you often look at like the front, you know, the person who's the figurehead of that group. But John was fascinating because as a player, like his style would change up, like even from like, you know, obviously band to band, but also even album to album. You know, he, he would have a different approach and he, he wasn't somebody, although he had um, his own, you know, he, he, there was amps that he liked and he was obviously very well known for using the flanger. I think he was very sensitive as well to whoever he was collaborating with at that time to be the best and make them the best that they could be and work within that rather than trying to overpower and take over the whole sound of it, you know, which really then, I think that's a real kind of interesting take actually, because I don't know how common that would be, particularly with a lead guitarist, to be that kind of aware of doing what you need to do to make the song the best it is without, you know, completely taking over the whole thing yeah i think that's actually the crux of the whole thing here the the thing that made him completely brilliant and made him an astounding guitar player and a very sensitive emotionally um sensitive guitar player is a thing that actually hides him from the uh, public domain in a sense isn't it you know the fact that when he's playing with the banshee he doesn't play all over susie he compliments susie compliments susie completely brilliantly but it's, it's kind of a um, it's, it's not like, say, Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin, where, you know, he's very much equal at the front. Yeah, absolutely. And funny you should mention Jimmy Page, because I've heard people refer to John as like the, the post-punk like Jimmy Page. And I don't really see that myself at all, you know. Um, but I think you're right. And that's, you know, you look at, I don't, I mean, oh my God, I'm a huge Banshees fan, massive. But for me, that they were at the peak of their powers with John. And they got Budgie, of course, at the same time. So they both worked on Kaleidoscope, Juju, and obviously A Kiss in the Dream House, which I think are the three the three best examples of, of the Banshees' work, really. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just, it's it's that idea of like creativity Um and being being open. And again, with John, I mean, the thing that's important about him as well, although obviously fantastic guitarist, but he could also play saxophone, could have a go on the piano. You know, there was a lot of different sort of strings to his bow, really. Um, and he would he would use that both with magazine and and with the banshees as well and bring that to the table. So there was a, just a lot of stuff that he could that he was capable of doing and bringing. Yeah, I mean, he, he could rock out on the guitar, of course, but he could also make the guitar sound like a synthesizer and sometimes it's quite difficult to tell what the guitar actually is and so i mean this is a real strength i mean was he was he just kind of noodling around he got a sound he liked would he hear the sound in his head and create it on his guitar or, or a combination i think a combination really i think a combination a bit you know a good bit of sort of experimenting with sound um you know very um aware of possibilities and being open to technology as well i mean you listen to um the track on Juju into the light, for example, and he uses, and it's gone from my head. And my God, I should know, I should know. We got it from Godly and Creme. Oh, anyway, it's the gizmo. Uh, the gizmo, that exactly, yeah, yeah. the gizmo. You know, attach that to the bridge, and it sort of has that kind of violin, kind of these cogs of the wheel that turn and give it that really just such a distinctive, amazing sound. You know, and that, that's that's what I love about John, and that's what I love. You know, if we're going to feature certain albums in particular, as that stand the test of time. I think with Juju, what's fascinating about that and what a kind of... they, For me, the Banshees almost sounded more like the Banshees with him there. It was like that, that was the, the, the just the super ingredient in it. And that album in particular is so fascinating because it is absolutely a post-punk classic. You could probably, I mean, I don't know, but you could probably put it within that goth kind of thing as well at the start of that. But it's also... As weird and peculiar as it is, it's also very, it's got a kind of pop, you know, it's got a pop appeal to it as well. You know, John was very good, I think, at, you know, getting that kind of catchy, those catchy riffs and, and working within that, which, you know, obviously worked so well for them because they did, you know, achieve a good bit of chart success at that time. Um, so his sound was, and I think we're talking about him, him sort of developing himself. You know, he'd look even at the way, like changing how he picked the strings, you know. So what, like, again, from from magazine where there was still kind of that flavor, that punky flavor to some of the, certainly on real life. You know, you hear it there. But by the time he's got to to, to ban the Banshees era, he's a different player and he's, he's he's working and thinking differently, which is, I think, really unusual, to be honest. It's interesting to mention the pop thing. Do you think that's another 
uh, reason that he doesn't get in those kind of guitar player lists because there is a snobbishness to pop, and I think. I think some of the great players understand pop, understand the nature pop, and how far you can push pop, you know, make it really interesting, you know, sonically, but still within the realms of something that could actually be a, a, a top to, a top 20 single. Yeah, it could well be, you know, and I, and maybe as, as well, you know, when we look at it, maybe as a personality, although I say he was very fiery, he was very uh, ambitious, maybe he wasn't as pushy. And also having said that, working, as you said, with the characters, that you, I mean, my God, you know, You've got Susie, you've got Richard Jobson, you've got John Lydon later. I mean, massive characters. And you're really going to have to, I mean, to sort of stand up with that and really sell yourself. You know, it's, it's a difficult, a difficult ask. Um, but I think, I just think John was very, just very open. So I don't think he'd have a snobbishness about him, you know, when it came to, it would just be a case of, well, what sounds the best? What makes the rest of the group sound best? And going in that direction. But of course, as well, by the time he'd left magazine and because they'd had so many difficulties really getting, getting noticed and really, you know, getting that wider appeal, he was hungry for that anyway. He wanted that success, you know, and he wanted to be in a successful group that he could see you know, it was taking him somewhere in his career as well. So the natural, I, I guess, approach for that would be to make music that is both interesting and a little bit subversive, but also has that kind of chart appeal as well. And that's a, I guess that's a really tough combination to try and try and make work. I mean, you, you, we're talking about guitar players and I think somebody who really understands that pop dynamic is somebody who's very influenced by it, by John McGeoch, and that would be Johnny Marr. You know, he's he knows that he loves pop stuff, you know, and he, he a good pop, obviously, and 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 he appreciates the power of that. And I don't think it should be underestimated, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can see a lot of John McGeoch's influence on, on Johnny Marr, even the way he kind of stands and plays guitar, you know, and the way he moves and things in in the mix. The interesting thing about Johnny Marr, though, is he yes, he does the John McGeoch thing of playing other people's projects and sitting in them and complimenting them brilliantly. But he also put his own group together, you know, with his own vision. And John McGeoch never really did that, did he? I mean, was there ever a point in his career when he he was looking for a singer to complement his guitar playing, which a lot of guitar players actually do? Mm. I think that probably would be when he did the Armoury show with Richard Jobson, uh, Russell Webb, and John Doyle, who'd been the drummer in Magazine. Um, you know, that was, that was very much um, sort of his group as much as, as anybody else is in that band, really. And I think the idea of that was some kind of, like, post-punky kind of super group type thing, you know? Um, but that never got the traction. Um, and I think it's probably a number of reasons for that, really. Um, pr you know, interestingly, anyway, just before, um, or just as sort of John had, had set the group up with Richard, um, he had an approach from John Lydon, even then, to come into Pill, which he'd had to knock back. And I think probably that was quite um, a difficult decision for him because he'd always been a massive Leiden, a particularly Leiden fan, but loved loved Pill as well. And, you know, respect to the guy because um, obviously it's, it's the, it was recently the anniversary of his, of, his, of his death, you know, Keith Levine. And that was somebody that I think John, you know, really uh, respected as a player, you know, at that time. Um, and, you know, we have to say, like, if we're going to, if I was going to say to you, what, what would be the pop, post pop an anthem for me? It would be that public image track and that guitar work on that is just so powerful, so different. Um, and that's what we, we, I guess, you know, in a way we're talking about as well, just generally with the whole post punk thing, you know, how many, and particularly coming out of Britain at that time as well, just how many inventive, different, you know, intelligent, interesting players there were, you know, who, again, probably don't get, I mean, it's not just John, I think, you know, I think when we look at post-punk as a whole, some really creative players who don't get their due. And, you know, Geordie Walker's one of them from Killing Joke, amazing. Vinnie Riley's another. Uh, Keith Levine, as we said, Will Sargent, you know, there's so many of them. Um, and John was, for me, at the, you know, right at the top of the tree with that. Um, and just so interesting, the groups that he ended up working with, who we really would have to say were, were post-punk powerhouses, you know? You know it's interesting, but we just talk about, you know, he worked with uh, singers who are very kind of dominant personalities, but he also generally, you know, through his career, replaced guitar players who were really iconic. I mean, that must be some kind of pressure. You know, iconic in those sort of smaller post-punk circles, but, you know, imagine stepping into Pill you know, uh, in Keith Levine's shoes. Imagine stepping into the Banshees. I mean, John McKay was a, was a great guitar player, wasn't he? You know, and, uh, you know, to, to make your mark in something that's already been staked out takes uh, takes somebody who's quite special, I think. 
Yeah, definitely. And having that belief as well and that confidence in, in what you're doing. And I think because he, he, you know, within those circles, as we're saying, he'd set the, 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 the bar so high with what he'd done with magazine. I mean, even if we were just to take two tracks as an example, and we're saying shot by both sides, but of course the light pours out of me as well. And then, I mean, for me, the finest example of John's work prior to him getting the success that he did with the Banshees would be Permafrost on Secondhand Daylight. And that guitar solo in there, it's so unusual. It's so not the typical kind of, you know, solo, but it shows a really creative mind. And again, we're talking about all the different bits of technology that he would be open to using. There's the harmonizer that comes into there. There's sort of bending the strings in and out of tune a little bit, getting the feedback. And so I think John was just, I think he had an inner confidence that he would be prepared to walk into any situation and feel that he could do an amazing job. I just think he backed himself um, and didn't probably doubt that for a second when it came to what his playing could do. Um, so, yeah, and, and he was, I mean, the whole pill thing, I'm sure we'll probably talk about it in, in, you know, in more detail, but it, it was such a probably quite a difficult time for them as a group, um, you know, I think to really kind of to keep evolving and to move on from what they had been to then that sort of mid eighties point. Um, and of course, <clears throat> prior to John joining, they'd released album and they'd used, you know, various different musicians on that. Um, so again, it was, you know, I think it was open in a way for John to come in and say, well, we've had a little breather from where Keith was and Jar Wobble and all that. You've had a few other people in, in the meantime, some have been good and some have been maybe not so good. Here I am, and I'll I'll show you exactly what I can can bring to the table. Yeah, and it does create a very different soundscape once he's settled into Pill, doesn't it? And his guitar style again, you could tell it's him, but he's actually he kind of morphs into another sort of version of himself, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I think I think we're looking at that sort of era where it was kind of like the MTV revolution was kind of kicking off, and it's got that. There is a lot of it that's got that kind of arena, kind of rocky vibe to it, which isn't. You know, maybe, you know, to my taste, my favourite sort of pe uh, period of John's work, uh, you know, I, but, but again, it just showed his sort of how fluid and sort of, you know, uh, changeable he could be and how in, in what, you know, to try and, you know, get that appeal. I think as well, what's in, what's important with that whole pill move was that the Armoury show had really not been successful at all. It had been really like commercially or whatever else a bit of a failure really so i think that hurt john you know he'd been used i think at that point his career just going up up and up up you know and, and, and having all the success that he did particularly with the banshees to then go into that and, and for it to be a real slog i don't think was where he wanted to be at that point in his career so moving then into pill you're in an established setup they're a name you know a very recognizable front man um it, yeah it just it just suited him down to the ground yeah, I mean, what, what changes did he make? You know, for each project, you know, the main projects, what would you say were the key changes in his his sound? You know, you could, you could sort of hear different effects coming in, different ways of playing, finger-picking, arpeggios, et cetera, uh, you know, more subtle sounds, more arena rock sounds. I mean, what, what were the signpost kind of changes that he made as he went along? Yeah, well, I think, you know, generally speaking, John's setup was a very simple one, and he kind of stuck with what worked. I think the big sort of departure was when he got to Pill, he, he changed his guitar as, as a starting point. You know, he, he worked with the Yamaha all throughout his time with, with Magazine and, um, of course, with the Banshees and then with the Armoury show. Um, and I think initially for a period he used it with um, Pill, but then moved on to the sort of more Americanized kind of rock metal type guitars. And I think that's because that's what he was enjoying listening to a little bit at that time as well. His own tastes were kind of changing up a bit. Um, and he was such, you know, in his own, he was such a guitar fanatic anyway, that he just loved all different types where the guitar was prominent, any type of music where, you know, you, you so stuff like, he'd go and see Def Leppard or whatever, you know, he, he would be into that kind of stuff, very open to it. And I think you kind of get that, that feel by the mid to late eighties with him, that it's, it's a, it's a different, different thing. Whereas the work that he was doing prior to that was very, um, was just very, some of it was very delicate, you know, very, very interesting, haunting, you know, and we're talking about the arpeggios and all that stuff. And that's really what we think of when we think of John McGeoch. And I think, 
you know, talking of, of the, 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 the thing that you would most associate with him, you know, in a kind of effects way would always, always be the flanger. It would always be. But of course, as well, I mean, we, we look, if we're going to get quite nerdy about it, like the, the choice of amps as well, you know, the Roland Jazz Chorus, you know, that jangle, that kind of, and, and you know, that that's a really distinctive part. I think, you know, particularly of John's, but I think it was also, you know, there was a lot of people at that time who were using them and experimenting with them. So yeah. he knew his stuff. He knew his stuff and he worked with great guitar techs as well who really you know, helped him along the way. But he was very loyal to those people, had good friendships with them. So, yeah, I remember speaking to John Leckie about it when we were talking about real life and the recording process of that. And he said it was so interesting because John would often like he'd come in and do his bit, but then he'd be away again. And at the time he was still studying for his degree. So he'd be coming down, recording and then going back to Manchester, doing what he had to do. Um, but he said that there wasn't a lot of arsing about, you know, there wasn't, he wasn't messing around for long. He kind of had his sound down and knew what he wanted to do, came in and did it. And that's the impression I get of John that it, you know, certainly in the earlier parts of his career, um, he just was, you know, he was a super professional. He was like really, really serious about his craft, took it very seriously and knew exactly what it was he wanted and how he wanted to come across and sound. Mm, I mean, so, I mean, when you when you sort of overlook his his whole career and his contribution, I mean, he's, he's influential and he influ influences the right people like a Johnny Marr, etc. I mean, what what do, what do you feel it is? You know, now you know, say now in twenty twenty three, is he like an undiscovered gem, or do you hear echoes of what he's doing in other people's work? Yeah, I do. I, I do sometimes hear that. There was a, a band. There's a band about called uh, Dry Cleaning, as an example, and uh, their guitar player. I thought, oh, God, I bet that guy, I bet he loves Keith Levine and I bet he loves John McGeeock because you can hear it there. You know, you can hear those sort of subtle influences. And interestingly, talking of influences, I think when you listen to John, it's very hard sometimes to sort of nail that down and, and, and just from his playing and think, well, God, who was he really into? Because he didn't really sound like anybody else. And I think that's that's one of the, you know, that's what you want from a guitar player. You know, you want somebody who as soon as you hear them, you're like, yeah, that's him. You know, you get who it is. Um, and John, you know, John's appeal, what is that? Uh, I just think it's the case of it's it's not just about him. You know, it's about the people he worked with and about the time as well. You know, it was such a, an interesting musically, such an interesting time. There was so much coming out. It was like every week there was a new band starting up or there was and it was it all felt, I guess, important. You know, and it all felt like it meant something probably like and maybe more so than it does today. I mean, I'm not going to start getting in a whole downer of where music's at right now, but there just seems to be so many. And that's, I guess that's partly what punk brought to it all, didn't it? Because it just sort of like smashed the doors down of like the whole kind of the rot that had set in within the, the, the music scene and the pop charts and all the rest of it. And it just then allowed for once that had kind of had its moment to an extent and uh, then for the whole post-punk thing and for people to be much more it's okay to be expressive and it's okay to show that you can play you don't have to be embarrassed about that and john you know certainly wasn't um and yeah he just hits and it's it's interesting because then you, you think well of the people that he influenced you know they're really cool interesting guitarists too and people who've gone on to have you know much bigger careers than John did and we said like Johnny Marr John Frusciante and the Red Hot Chili Peppers absolutely adores John McGeoch you know loves particularly the Banshee stuff really loves it um you know so there's there's just that kind of thing with it and it's 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 just bloody good music and and that will always out I think and that will always be relevant and important you know particularly at a time like now when maybe you know, what's lovely sometimes is when somebody will get in touch with you about it and they're maybe 16, 17 years old and they'll actually write to you and say, Do you know, finding like discovering the records in my parents' collection and listening to that guitar work was what inspired me to want to pick up a guitar. And you think, well, that's brilliant, man. That's it. That's great. And that just proves that it is still important and means something. I mean, speaking of that, you know, how much your book has uh, reframed, you know, John's you know, not so much image, but, you know, his influence or his terms of influence, you know, has, has your book helped this process and is it kind of spotlighted certain aspects of what he did? Oh, well, I'd certainly like to think so. Um, and certainly the response to it has been like really, really positive. And I think what speaks volumes about, 
not just his kind of playing ability, but also who he was as a personality and how how highly you know people thought of him was just how many people got involved with the book. I mean, it's crazy, really. Like, and from all different kind of areas. I mean, what I wanted to do with it, obviously, you want to have the main players there. You want to have the people who worked with him, the people who are big names in those kind of circles. But I also wanted to extend that out. So then I just started like listening to, like I said, about people that I thought may, maybe liked what he did. And that like perfect examples of that, who people wouldn't expect, would be uh, Sakis Tollis from the band Rotting Christ, which is like a black metal band from Greece. Really cool. But I just thought, I like them anyway. And I thought, mm, you know, maybe he was into them. And he was. Massive, massive fan of John McGeoch. And the same with Miller Petrosa from Creator as well. You know, so and that I love that that it's not just then confined to any one particular genre. Players from all different kind of backgrounds can can say no. Well, as I was growing up, you know, I loved the work that John was doing, um, and so that's when we get into the whole sort of thing of the book. That's what I really wanted to put across that just that you know actually this guy hasn't maybe had the attention he deserves. But my God, look how many people want to sort of you know come forward and talk about him and from a variety of places that you wouldn't even necessarily assume you know not just the post-punk thing but beyond that you know and um yeah that's one of the the great successes of it i think and so i hope that it has um sort of reignited an interest or even from a point of view of just like myself wanting to read about him i'm sure there was a, i'm sure there were a lot of people who felt the same as me and so there it is now it's available and hopefully it's something that john would have felt you know happy with because it's very difficult isn't it when you're writing about somebody um particularly like as you said like when it wasn't of my era and you have to be really sensitive to that i think you can't then just walk all over it and talk like you're some kind of know it all when well you weren't even there mate i mean it's like it's hard to, for me to picture what Manchester would have been like in the mid to late seventies, but through talking to people who were there um, at the time, you really got a sense of it. So I wanted that to be how it was in the book that these people would kind of give you the story and you would just sort of weave in and out around that without kind of taking over and, and boring people. So hopefully, you know, hopefully it's, it's gone down well. And what with the film, is it, is it basically, um, just a book made into film or is a part of the story that you think could be explored further or a change in the dynamic or a change in the direction? Yeah, I think obviously the book is kind of like, it, it's that's the kind of reference point, I think, for, for, for the sort of general theme of the story. But within that, what's interesting um, is that Nicola Black and Paul Sung, who are sort of co-directing it and are the sort of driving forces behind it. Of course, Paul um, will be well known um, for having put together polystyrene. I'm a cliche. Amazing. Great stuff. Um, so I was delighted that, you know, he's part of that. Um, but I think they've also picked up on certain little points that maybe were addressed in the book in some way, but have wanted to expand upon it. So things like masculinity, you know, st gender stereotypes um, and just and, and you know, men, you know, mental health. Um, addiction issues and of course like one of the for me anyway the biggest theme uh, certainly towards the end of the book and the one that's probably most poignant and most moving is the relationship that John had um, with his daughter Emily which is so it was such a it just put everything I think really into perspective of, of what what a biography maybe for me was about you know it's 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 not just about the legacy of the music but you know you look at people as individuals and think well what greater legacy is there than than a daughter speaking so lovingly about her father and, and remembering stuff that you just think wow like he was a different guy like he really was um so that's going to be a big part of the documentary as well the relationship with emily yeah i mean you know despite the fact that we're here talking about his guitar playing his main his biggest achievement in his life and the one that was you know the main thing for him is the relationship with his daughter and so that's is that the crux of the story in the film would you say i think it's certainly going to be a big sort of yeah a very big factor of it um because of course she's uh you know she's exactly the sort of person or the, the person that you'd want to go to and say you know tell us about john mcgeoch away from you know maybe the the glitz and the glamour and the stage and the tours and the great albums that, you know, we all kind of know about, but actually to get a bit more of an insight into, 
into the different um, sort of aspects of, of, of the man's personality. And he was really, as I say, he was a different guy. And I found that, you know, looking into his life, he was, he was so interesting. You just, you just wanted to keep writing about him because there was, there was always different bits of information coming out. And he had so many different sides to his personality. Um, I mean, we could talk about him getting into care work as an example, which I just blew my mind. I just thought to have the career you've had and then to be kind of sort of humble enough, really, to say, well, that's over now and I've got to crack on. I've got to do something and to want to do that. You know, that resonated as well, because, of course, that's my background. I don't know anything about making music. I haven't got a clue, you know, but I do know what it's like to do care work. It's all I've ever done. So for John to have done that really spoke to me. And I was like, wow, this is you know, what this is some different guy. You know, um, and so, yeah, I think all those things will also be explored in the film as well um, and will be be interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds really great. I mean, so how far down the line are you to get the film made? Is this, you're in the exploration process at the moment, trying to raise funding, get, trying to get the interviews in place, et cetera. So are you feeling um, optimistic, positive that this thing can actually get made? Because it'd be a great film. Um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, oh, I mean, we need to raise more money. I mean, that's the, you know, that's there's no. I can't dress that up. We had a really strong first week on the Kickstarter where we got like ten grand in. We need to raise forty, and I think we're around thirteen now, and we've got about just over two weeks left to really to really push on. So we need to have a big week um, moving forward. Um, I'm I'm so I'm, I'm hopeful. Of course, I am, and I'm I'm delighted that there would be people who'd want to make this film because I do think it will be different and I do think it will be interesting. And I think from a point of view as well, just if we're just talking from the music alone, there's so much to draw upon there, which I think will appeal to people. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get this over the line. Um, but as I said, we do, we definitely need more people to get on board and get some more money in. Um, what's really cool about the whole Kickstarter is there's all these different pledge packages. So you can actually, you know, put money in and get stuff that belonged to John um, from his from his career, like items of clothing that he wore on stage. You know, so there are sort of like rewards and things there that are definitely worth checking out. Yeah, well, that sounds great. Well, good luck with that, Rory. I think um, it'd be a great project. I think I think you'll you'll get there. I think it's because it's it's the kind of story that people really want to hear. I mean, the book went really well. And it's definitely something that lends itself to film as well. So I can see that working. You've got, you've got the right team to make it as well. So it's all in place. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Yeah.